it's not, you know, it's updated every so often, and you know, it's not this, you're not going to have a 2005 inventory until you know 2010, right? So, you know, that's probably not sufficient. So there's a lot of issues there depending on what you want. So if you're worried about the global climate, you know, the 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 coarser inventory is is probably fine. But then if you're worried about what's happening regionally, it may not be. And it's actually probably not. It's likely not. Let me so. just give you, for example, the downscaling rules for population do not account for the fact that in the United States, over historical times, we've seen population move south and west. So they essentially scale populations based on where they are today. And so over 25 or 30 years, when they're looking at China or India, you're trying to understand where population is going within regions as opposed to just scaling up an existing population distribution, which is difficult enough for lots of parts of the world. So we've got some, we've got some fundamental areas in socioeconomics where we need to work on rules. And so, so the question is, you know, how sensitive are the are your climate models to the precise so, location of these non-well mixed gases? So I would I would break that into two issues for the short term, high resolution inventory, higher resolution inventories and projections. So one is historical inventories. You know, there, there's a large delay in getting those out and um, and getting them out globally. So you, you would probably want higher resolution global in, inventories for the short-lived gases and then the uh, projections that would go along with that. And then the question is how important are those differences? And I think in, in reality what it's going to be is if this is to be done, then there, there, there has to be a definite process set up to produce the inventories or at least collect the available inventories and use them to help with producing projections that are on a gridded basis. And that process doesn't exist now. So that would need to be set up and done. And essentially, in, realistically, you know, whatever process that's up will do the best job it can. It'd be less than ideal, and that's what will be used. Mm -hmm. But if a process is set up ahead of time, realizing we have to actually do that, it'll be a much better than you know, deciding, well, we're going to do these runs in a year. We need we need emission scenarios over a thirty year period, and then it's slapped together. That's going to be a much worse product. So, what was Naki saying that there's a single short term scenario that goes to twenty thirty? Um, many of the groups that do energy <coughs> modeling, like the I International Energy Agency, tend to do you know a single scenario. Although you know something like their the U.S. EIA does three a high, medium, and low, but they're not particularly just for the U.S. though, mm. and it's not particularly, you know, complex or, you know, mm. it, and it doesn't include emissions or reactive gases or mm. anything like that. Mm. So, as John Francois said, they did a, did something where Yasa provided short-term reactive gas scenarios from the um, pollution group, basically, and they had these different different levels of emissions controls in these three scenarios. So that's analogous to what <laughs> might be needed. As to so, whether or not high resolution inventories are really necessary as far as the climate change goes. Mostly we're used to looking at climate change in larger scales and for that you figure, nah, it's not so important. But once you're getting down to really trying to say what is actually happening on a one half degree resolution model, now maybe there will be an impact of the high resolution releases. I don't think we have enough experience to know that. For the well mixed gases. Well, in particular for aerosols. Aerosols. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the okay. Problem. Then, then, okay. Yeah, yeah. Problem and, is, and you and start maybe, doing yeah. that, you get the high resolution and that kind of stuff. Then you got to bring in all your next level of process right. sophistication to, pro to do it correctly. That's right. Yeah. Well, right. 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 Um, and so then you're. It's not just. Then it's just not your resolution it's stuff. Your then resolution. it's the complexity. And then how much do we know about cloud breaking aerosol? You know, secondary aerosol formation mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. That because mm -hmm. you're starting to approach those resolutions where you can't make the gross assumptions you can of course resolution. Yeah. Right. Well, I don't think, you know, they're, as you well know, David, I mean, they're not saying we're going to produce things on a half degree level, but you're going to produce them sort of regionally over, over two or three degrees, so you've got some reserve, you know, so you're averaging over yeah. some number of group yeah. points. Yeah. Um, now, why I sort of said these, to me, these are orthogonal is that if you're yeah. thinking about going towards the sort of Earth, Earth system model type, like they're talking over there, you probably say, well, you're going to keep your resolutions mm -hmm. around the same. Yeah. You'd add in all these extra uh, components, and that would change the climate 
<clears throat> on how much. I mean, it depends on, on who you listen to. But you'd think it would be a sort of relatively, uh, relatively small signal, and then to balance up, say, energy balance and whatever, you would need to tweak your parameters a little, but nothing, you know, nothing too large. So, in other words, the sort of parameterization development would not would only be a relatively small part of that, and most of the development would be into the new components. Now, if you're talking about running all these components at half a degree, there's a whole bunch of work to be done there. Are, are your parameterizations relevant yeah. for half a degree? Everything's going to have to be, um, you know, re-evaluated, etc. So that is, as I said, it seems uh, well, <laughs> orthog well, orthogonal to me. But yeah. you're also then, I mean, it seems to be the more I hear people talk about this, you're talking about a modeling system with two versions. A more AOGCM type with a either fixed or very simple biogeochemistry cycling carbon cycle for the shorter term things. And then the coarser resolution, more sophisticated process model for the longer term stuff because when you when you get to these scales where you're talking about, now you're getting into the folks that are very interested in what Jerry's been doing for years, you know, with the intermediate scale variability and natural, you know, then, then you're into PDO cycles and you're into NAO cycles and you're into the natural signal on top of whatever force right. signal. And, and most of those people are are going with resolution and better representation of things. Yeah. I mean, so, so it's one of the things you would have to do with this fine resolution model is you first have to show that you can have confidence in it. So you'd probably have to run the 1850 to 2000 time frame and show you can reproduce regionally now what actually happened. Because if you can't do regionally what happened over that time frame, how can you expect it to do regionally what's going to happen and over that time frame? And you're going to have to run it as an ensemble. But then how do you deal with the assimilation problem as you're doing that? Right? There's also, yeah. I mean, variability is a big, a significant issue, I think. So, so if we have clearly that, your ENSOs aren't going to happen in those <laughs> high, proper years. So or even just evaluating uh, Im, you know, uh, impacts, uh, just to ensure that you can evaluate, say, the probabilities of extreme events or changes of them. Okay. The evaluation of the in, uh, variability is fundamental for that. No, so my feeling is, if we're held to that criterion, David, we won't do any of these. <laughs> 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 so I don't believe we're going to be held to that criterion. Um, but it, it's true that if you're going to do this, I don't know why you go back to 1870. But I mean, for this sort of ocean in, initialization, you'd need to go back some number of years, 1970 or something. Do it out for those 35 years, uh, and then if you if you think you know the state of the ocean over that the last 10 or 15 years, then you start nudging the solutions towards that state. So you've yeah. got to do something in the past. Yeah, that's clear. Whether it's back to 1870 is uh, yeah. is not. What kind of changes so. in statements about reliability are you going to make to those of us who use the outputs doing the <laughs> Oh, man. I mean, who invited what? you? <laughs> well, but I mean, we, we get these statements that, well, you shouldn't trust anything less than three months and you shouldn't trust anything less than about four or five degrees uh, in terms of reliability at all. Um, and so, if the point is to be able to talk about very fine scale changes in structure, mm -hmm. um, what, what's the message for those of us who would use that in doing impacts? Well, I mean, it's one of the rationales I've heard for, for doing this higher resolution is that things like evaluation of the changes in extremes would be better with higher resolution. Uh, Jerry, you you can well, I think say whether that's true or not. Precipitation extremes. Temperature extremes seem to do pretty well in the current generation we've got, but the precipitation Extremes are the ones that you always have problems with because you know precipitation is just more spatially noisy, right. and, and you also get you know is more topography dependent and things like that. Right. They still. I mean, it it still seems an odd. If you think, I think for that, I mean, really, you want to use the regional model. The no. Region, well, no, you don't. You're still nope. 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 the large scale model is. Regional good. model is nothing but a big diffuser. <laughs> it's a different <laughs> dynamical so that. that, that there is a theoretical problem with doing those type of long-term forecasts with a nested model. You have two different dynamical systems and there's no force constraint that the climate that you get 
over the region you're simulating with the limited area model is the same as that that you'd get with the global model at comparable resolution over that same region. So that's theoretically wrong way to approach a problem. And if you look, you can do that for specific events, you can do that to build climatologies, but you cannot use that for forecasting. So, it's just wrong. Well, there's also people working on two-way nesting. I mean, the, this you know the uh, nested regional model where all the forcing just goes into the regional model and you generate your own climate. That's kind of what's been done so far. Mm -hmm. People have been talking about doing two-way nesting where the regional right. model is actually feeding back Feedbacks, out. Yeah. And there are but people the, working on that, but that's never been done successfully yeah. yet between two different model systems. You can get higher grid resolution within the same model, but with, with an actual embedded regional model, it's different a different model. It's that, that the right way to do it's with the time slice with a very high resolution. That's a sort of 10, 12 year time, uh, time frame. Plus or out theoretical, uh, right. practical issues. Right. Yeah. So, to both of those. so yeah. you've, yeah. Just, right. you've just sort of heard why they say we should do as high a resolution <laughs> as we can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there, there are options. I mean, and, and, and like Isaac's but, doing this, I think better probably now more than anybody else we're trying to do it a little bit i think isaac's probably got it farther down the road is is with the time slice and that you take the course resolution coupled coarser still a fairly high resolution coupled gcm you take the surface and particularly the sst information from that and then you drive a very high resolution atmosphere so it's, a, it's basically nesting but on a global scale with just a surface forcing and then you get the atmosphere to behave correctly using a system where, of course, the primarization will be slightly different, but it's very close to the simulation that was, to the system that was used to build the original so, forecast. And this is what was done at, on your simulator. They did a 20 kilometer global model. They took uh, SSTs, one you can tell, tell about what, it, what you yeah. did. So on your simulator, we uh, are forced to work on a high resolution uh, model. And so we, uh, conventional resolution uh, system type model for more than 200 years simulation. This is one way, one line of research. Another line of research is a high resolution, well, relatively <laughs> high resolution <laughs> couple model with uh, 100 kilometer, one degree atmosphere and uh, 20 by 30 kilometer eddy permitting ocean couple uh, doing 20th century, 21st century uh, experiment once, no sample. And then uh, there is a global uh, 20 kilometer mesh atmospheric GCM uh, developed by uh, JMA uh, using the time slice uh, experiment uh, given SST uh, try to reproduce control and put up and then uh, that succeeded uh, that, that these three lines of uh, research succeeded in uh, uh, talk more about uh, precipitation extremes and the impact of the typhoon hurricanes and uh, now we are considering the problem that the uh, time slice 20 kilometer AGCM is striking and uh, we could say much more about uh, the regional details and especially the extremes but uh, very recent uh, research says that the, uh, it still depends on sea of temperature and then because of the time schedule they used a fairly uh, um, rough resolution uh, 300 kilometer or so of uh, uh, projected sea surface temperature. Now they are using uh, the high resolution the results of the high resolution couple model, and then uh, that the result uh, quantitatively depends on uh, sea surface temperature used, and especially the extreme event, uh, the t tail end of the extreme uh, of PDF, is very sensitive quantitatively uh, to the existence of coupling or decoupling. And then generally, uh, SST given AGCM tend to overemphasize uh, the, the precipitation extremes because, uh, you know, uh, fine weather, high SST, no clouds. This is uh, nature. But uh, uh, high SST, a lot of clouds and uh, storms, this is uh, SST given AGCM. So that it tends to emphasize, like, for example, the hurricane strains and uh, extreme. Uh, severe weather and so on so so uh, even though uh, in the time slice is only once no no ensemble so now uh, we are in the next phase we are considering that uh, try to uh, succeed this line of research and try to make uh, uh, ensemble of uh, high resolution maybe uh, couple and time slice uh, experiment
to try to uh, provide more PDF-like information for the uh, application people. So, uh, and th there, there are regional climate projection uh, efforts in parallel with, with this one, and that uh, used uh, conventional 300 kilometer couple model and uh, 20 kilometer regional Asian model. But <laughs> that, that model is <laughs> obviously obs became became obsolete <laughs> in, in the presence of the 20 kilometer AGCM. So that uh, that may not continue. Another line of uh, regional ne <laughs> nesting. Uh, results uh, is uh, based on a high resolution AGCM time slice and then uh, they nested uh, five kilometer or recently two kilometer uh, cloud resolving uh, regional model for Japan area and they claim something but uh, <laughs> in my opinion uh, message uh, climate projection message from 20 km AGCM and the 5 km nested regional model are not very much different because the regional model is so small that the bayou may front movement and everything is uh, so much regulated by the uh, large, larger scale model and then uh, it is very much difficult to tune, uh, physically tune uh, the uh, tail end of the extreme events so that even though the AG, uh, 20 km AGCM has, uh, uh, in comparison with the uh, satellite estimate, estimate, the precipitation in intensity versus uh, frequency kind of diagram, uh, and the tail has, uh, the spectrum of the tail has a lot of problem, and so is the uh, cloud resolving model. So, uh, uh, although if everything goes okay, then the regional nested approach would be you know economical and nice but at this right moment uh, it is like a gamble <laughs> mm. uh, so in terms of resource and in terms of schedule so we so you can see that massa is one of the real problems uh, uh, about why we've been given this pressure I think <laughs> because the Japanese have okay. essentially done some of this um, and <coughs> they are producing uh, Things on region, you know, on high resolution. Yes. So uh, at the scale moment, yeah, we are considering in the, in the next phase, when we uh, research for AR five, we uh, we are saying the same thing, exactly the same same thing. Yep. Uh, longer term uh, projection with the Earth system model and shorter term uh, thirty year uh, prediction with some initialization and. Uh, I am not sure if uh, we can initialize the summer islands like this, <laughs> but at least the uh, upper, <laughs> upper ocean, we have an uh, analysis system and uh, we started doing nothing. But probably the uh, uh, phase of the ENSO may not uh, matter so much. But anyway, we, we have a two, two, three years. Uh, In particular, I think it's this result that. Uh, that you say you know it's influencing the frequency and the strength of typhoons in your uh, in your area that has come down to say can we do the same in the U.S. for hurricanes? I mean I think this is what's driving it. Yeah. So what we are concerned more is how to uh, quantify uncertainty, uh, uncertainty in terms of uh, number of ensemble with the same scenario uh, or. Uh, even with the same scenario, different physical parameterization the extremes are so sensitive to uh, physical parameterization. So uh, we are now worrying about how we introduce uh, physics perturbations into the model. And try not to do, try not to use a single model for a time science experiment. But it seems that it's a difficult spot to be in because if. I mean, it's not clear, and I, I think whoever's pressuring is maybe not completely sure what they want, as usual, right? But, you know, one of the things they would want is, you know, high resolution and give us more information on extremes, except that's the part of the model that, you know, you trust the least, or one of one of the things that one doesn't trust, or then it's known to be biased, so that, that's a problem. Then the other question is, if it's high resolution to get, you know, regional climate changes, you know, other than extreme sort of mean climate changes, then, you know, maybe, I don't know, is there the role for regional models or you just don't like regional models in any event? 
I, well, part of it is familiarity breeds contempt, and see, so that's that's a community I came out of, and, and it's 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 a different system. I mean, part of the, my my major problem with them is is just that you're coupling two different dynamical systems together in ways that are ad hoc, and you're not necessarily getting a consistent result on something where small systematic errors over long periods of time matter. Oh. So that's 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 the first part. The second part is if you go to look at and you know, two years ago when I, when we visited you folks for the for the meeting, I thought you guys are going to be three years ahead of everybody else, and now I see in two years you're ahead of everybody else. So that that kind of is, is even more discouraging because I see the gap getting bigger. But um, you know that the the other problem is that if you look from applied climate standpoint, it's very event driven. Precipitation, droughts, things like that are events of different time scales. They're not mean quantities. So Jerry's done a lot of work on heat waves. Um, Great Tripoli, Wisconsin is trying to develop a severe weather index based on, you know, large scale climate things, but he needs 50 kilometer information. So once you get into the realm of beyond mean statistics, you're really looking, when you start looking at the tails of the PDFs, you're looking at the difference of events. And events are important. And events are better simulated from, we know this, from weather prediction with high resolution, very well tested models that, that are that treat the phys physical processes correctly it's not well tested <laughs> well and, whether and correctly for that matter well, well, well weather models are well tested they get tested <laughs> they get, they get yeah, tested yeah, yeah. every day yeah, against yeah. observations yeah. and and if you look at what the european center does actually they you know they do these data deprivation yeah. experiments where they say okay if i take out this little tiny piece of the initialization how does my solution degrade well maybe that's well, that's a key to, to get reinitialized every day too right yeah well, that's right it's an initial careful. value it's definitely so, an initial value well, problem well maybe that's really the key point that comes in front of all this that if the goal is you know a short term run of a climate model in forecast mode that is a fundamentally different way of operating these models so in a sense you need to back up and think what are the you know is that something we can even do in in a you know way that we would trust or is that something that we don't really know how to do and we really need to say well okay this is great but we don't know really know how to do this we need to do the science to figure out how to do it before we put a result on your table I don't know what you're the <laughs> you do know how to do seasonal forecasts. Right. And some of these which events are of seasonal the, length. Which does go beyond the initial right. initialization issue a bit. Um, and I don't know if that gives us uh, some insight into how to go to the Cato scale, which is basically the next scale. Right. Well, if, if the it's, seasonal it's one... seamless, Norm. You just, you just yeah, can't well, go ahead. Yeah, we definitely don't want to go down that what's road. What's seamless really? <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, if, if the question, seasonal... Uh, just the if the seasonal area, forecast is done there. with specified sea surface temperatures, then that is not an analog for what's being attempted here, because we don't have it. So if you really wanted to do that seasonal forecast, you'd have to do it with a coupled AO with the ocean initialized somehow, and then see how well do you do. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And then before going too far, I, I uh, let me make allow allow me to make uh, be more precise about the regional uh, nesting nest model. Uh, although I said that our regional model uh, didn't. I mean, uh, was, uh, the, well, there were some, <laughs> I, I say, uh, some weak weak points, but that uh, mainly came from our uh, regional uh, com complexity, uh, like uh, uh, atmospheric uh, uh, rain band is so much dependent on the larger scale, and it was very difficult with uh, uh, 300 kilometer mesh model, couple model to uh, position it precisely. That is the major reason. Uh, why we uh, are slightly away from the regional approach. But uh, generally speaking, I think uh, the regional extreme detail is so much dependent on the uh, regional uh, small-scale topography so that the topographic uh, effect is generally very well uh, represented. And so, of course, uh, uh, overall uh, judgment uh, would prefer, uh, you know, uh, global high resolution uh, modeling but uh, many occasions I think the regional high resolution mod modeling would work for short term uh, 
uh, projection so that uh, short beam. we don't have to you know uh, how to say, uh, exclude uh, such possibility if uh, uh, somebody wants region of immediate uh, prediction uh, nested prediction would be one of the possibilities I, I guess we did a lot of work with the MM5 regional model for the Northeast U.S. Mm -hmm. New York area. And we forced it with a coarser grid model. And this is not a region where topography plays a dominant role. There are oh, locations in the so New yeah. Jersey, and then there's sea breezes like off that. the ocean. And one of the things that made it seem to us like less science and more art was that when we use different configurations, in the physics package from the MM5, the convection, the boundary layer, the clouds, we got really different answers when forced with the same GCM forcing. And then we said, well, a way to discriminate is to look at, see which of these configurations does a better job for the current climate. Well, the same one that did better for temperature did not do better for precip. So ultimately, the differences between the different configurations were actually larger than the climate changes between the 2080s and the 1980s. Okay, so Although then, I guess the question so there is, are those differences larger than the differences we see between different GCMs? I mean, is that, in a sense, analogous? Um, I, what I remember, of they, they did this Turks thing, and they kind of looked at, at some of the intercomparison of the regional models, and they found out the biggest, the biggest differences among the models from the downscaling were the GCMs that used to drive them that all the regional models produce a very similar result with the same GCM, and they all produce very different results depending on which global model they use for forcing. But you still run into the same set of problems that David is saying, that you, you have these parameterizations that are highly uncertain, that your result is still highly dependent on those parameterizations. Cloud resolving doesn't help to eliminate some of that uncertainty with respect to the dynamics, but it doesn't eliminate it with respect to the microphysics and the radiative interactions, particularly in very weak dynamical systems like a, you know, a stratus deck, you know, you're not, they've done LES inter comparisons of, of marine stratocumulus layers and those solutions from LES simulations diverge depending on the parameterizations they use for the microphysics and the radiative interactions. So it's, it, I think it's better to, you know, so all this comes around intuitively, it just seems that the, the fewer number of model systems you're working with <laughs> You know, provides you a, a, a one less orthogonal axis of problems you got to deal with when you're when you're trying to give a estimate of uncertainty and look at these things that are not part of a a mean answer when you're trying to look at, at variability and extremes and things like that. You're thinking that these are sort of orthogonal uh, ways, and you're trying to minimize the amount of model development that needs to is going on. What you'd say is. We use the sort of present resolution, and some groups go off looking to develop into the Earth system model. But for this problem, you'd say, okay, we take the version of, say, CCSM that we use for the last IPCC, and that then you can just try to do the increased resolution in it. Work on some of these initialization problems, and then you have to work on some of the initialization and problems. How, and how about parameters? They, how about in the, if you're in forecast mode, how much can you do in terms of moving toward the weather models in terms of testing and trying to figure out the weather models almost always don't produce good climates? Yeah. 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 Well, I meant no, I don't mean in, in terms of moving toward them, I meant in terms of the procedures and testing. I mean, this idea of that's what that's what the community is doing. Well, I mean, yeah, every group is running their atmospheric model against against forecasts in some way, and in, in different different out to check out to see how well it's doing with with, with short term dynamics and propagation of you know so, major weather so storms. So, how you get into atmospheric initialization issues if you really try to run it as a forecast model? Yeah, and right. it hasn't been run as a forecast model no, previously. That's... Right. My personal impression is that for the IPCC purpose, even so, even though short-term prediction, uh, ocean initial ocean information will be sufficient, and right. we don't have to do any uh, serious atmospheric right. uh, data simulation. Right. And there, there is a possibility that uh, doing atmospheric initialization of uh, 
uh, not the temperature, not the wind, but uh, physical, more physical variables, chemistry, aerosols, and so on, and to try to improve, uh, try to con contribute to development of the physics package. That, but that, that's a research mode, and uh, uh, that uh, you know makes uh, model climate shift uh, to a uh, different way from uh, models uh, intrinsic climate, so that uh, it may not be good uh, to let that system go. Uh, for 20, 30 years. So, therefore, uh, I think... So, what, what, well, what I want to... I mean, you just mentioned chemistry, for instance. What I just said, there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any chemistry in this uh, model because it's not in our present uh, system. So, I want to phrase the question, if we kept sort of our present system, which, for instance, doesn't have any indirect aerosol effect, what... I mean, is that... Is that sensible at all? What uh, are we losing out of these short-term forecasts if we don't have some of the processes that we're talking about yeah. over there that are in, in the system model? I mean, well, it looks to me like... Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, in terms of relative error, I don't think this is going to be a relative error, leaving those things out. I, I don't think that's yeah. going to be the largest source of error. The largest source is that haven't developed the model with this resolution, and that takes time. Yep. But two, getting, the, yeah. the clouds, getting the clouds and, and the climate and the, all that stuff right at higher resolution is something that's not been done because you're not dealing in any... Where, I mean, this is what Jim spent all of his time on, right? Right. You so, know, you're not dealing in an area where there's a nice, clean spectral gap, which is why, sorry. you know, the, the European Center, right, they actually went to higher resolution had to back off because their forecast degraded when they went... Yeah. Past a certain place because they couldn't match your parameterizations to the scale yeah, of the, exactly. of the, um, of the physics. You must have to ask what the questions are going to be. For example, if you're worried about hurricanes, what is the operative question? Is it landfall or is it clustering of landfall points for hurricanes that develop in certain sectors? I mean, maybe there's a set of questions that resolution is very important for, but the details of the physics, given that you have at least sort of minimal capability of representing clouds and radiation are not so critical. How, how did, uh, when you went to your 20 kilometer global model, that was just another version of one of your previous models, right? I was just about to mention it. And uh, our experience, maybe uh, optimistic experience, <laughs> was that uh, we came from uh, 300, 200 kilometer uh, conventional GCM and kept the parameterization almost the same. We didn't really do any anything special. And then try to you know uh, run it on the highest resolution and then tune it uh, for uh, convection and uh, boundary layer and then watching the extreme behavior. So that was sufficient in our, in our case. Uh, at uh, our institution and also at the JMA, we do have two separate uh, lines of uh, uh, institutional efforts. But uh, they also, um, I mean, a 20 kilometer mesh has been done by JMA people, but they didn't really uh, introduce anything uh, special. So they kept uh, the same uh, convection parameterization and uh, they kept the same PBL, and we also did. So our 300 kilometer couple model and 100 kilometer couple model only differs in physics and some uh, ocean <laughs> uh, edit treatment. Wait, this is the 300 and the 100? Yeah, and uh, 300, 100 and up to 20 kilometer. And we do have 60 kilometer atmosphere experience and then they have 20 kilometer uh, atmosphere. Uh, right. So all we have to worry about is that uh, top of the atmosphere uh, radiation budget and try to keep uh, climate drift minimum. So up to 20 kilometers or so, I don't think uh, not much serious consideration on existing parameterization. And then go to 10 kilometer and 5 kilometer, uh, there comes the co pro problem of a uh, convective parameterizability. And then it was not hydrostatic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, start worrying about the hydrostatic. And what probably. Should, what should you Japan might want to talk kilometers. to mesoscale well, people. Supposedly, it's, and it's below five that you start really seeing yeah. non hydrostatic. No, yeah, you can you can go down to five kilometers before you have non hydrostatic effects. I think. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 that's, yeah. That's, I think it's that, more that, like two to three kilometers. That scale analysis was done, you know, like I said, the, so back if in the our optimistic uh -huh. uh, impression is correct, then uh, uh, not so much. You, you don't 
I have to worry so, not so, so much about the, uh, uh, the, the structural change of the existing system. But well, one thing you mentioned, though, is you did have to tune for extremes. Yeah. And that has been our experience, too. When you go to really fine resolution, yeah. both yeah. horizontal yeah. and yeah. vertical, yeah. Yeah. then the extremes necessary. can really pick up. Yeah. And if the extremes are one of the things you're trying to get at, that yeah. does seem to imply yeah, that, that the process is necessary. Time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mechanistic increase of the uh, resolution doesn't work. In our case, it didn't work. So we have to worry about the cumulus triggering and then everything. I try to make the uh, tail spectrum. How do you tune for extremes? <laughs> I mean, maybe my use of are word tuning about, may not may not be appropriate. Change but in the variability. Yeah, uh, the convective parameterization in our case had uh, really right. you know spotty uh, uh, performance in the tropics, and that was very uh, bad for discussing the uh, organized activity, convective activity in the tropics. So that, that's why we have to somehow control uh, the occurrence of the cumulus. That that is the uh, content of the our ma major content of our tuning. Such such uh, activity is necessary, but. Uh, the structure of the code, uh, model code itself, may not be so much different. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we may, might want to. Did you to change the vertical resolution at the same time? Yes, uh, we changed it uh, from 20 kilometer of the 300 kilometer model to uh, 20 levels to 56 levels in order to better resolve uh, uh, top boss and uh, boundary layer. You're either lucky or very good. <laughs> <laughs> they, got, they got good people and they got a dedicated computing resource. Good people and a dedicated computing resource leads to great results. I mean, it's just <laughs> <laughs> so is that similar to what you had to do? Or? Uh, well, what we we went to much higher vertical resolution, for example, and uh, we found that the high vertical resolution. We thought if we're going to find horizontal resolution, we need to resolve the small vertical wavelengths of these waves. And when we, when we went to high vertical and high horizontal, then the results were very different than just fine horizontal and relatively coarse vertical. That that vertical really initiated, it, it, it sort of pushed the, the whole model into another regime almost. Did you maintain the domain depths as well? Yeah. Because that yeah. actually should come along with higher resolution. Well, these, these are models that extend way up in the okay. atmosphere, so no that wasn't an issue. But So I'm just wondering if you went to very fine vertical resolution, whether you would not find, again, an additional change that would result at the high horizontal resolution. I don't know. That that's at least was our experience. So that's actually a question. Is this just change in, in uh, you know, lat long resolution without vertical resolution? Is that even sensible or no? no, no. It's a 3D. Yeah, uh, you have to do both. But, but, uh, yeah. we, we live on that and 2D. Even, <laughs> and, and I think also like, a domain issue because it's a, a domain issue as well because you might start resolving waves that tend to propagate up quite rapidly and get, find themselves up in, near your upper boundary. And if you haven't done something right, to ensure that you don't get spurious effects mm -hmm. from that, uh, then you know, might well get answers that are not. One example was with a very fine vertical and horizontal, our Hadley cell was like, in, in uh, July, was like 300 times 10 to the 9. So that was even greater than the Hadley cell has been able to get in their sort of most extreme version. Whereas without the fine vertical resolution, it was down like at 230, 240, which meant the whole hydrologic cycle had really amplified greatly when we combine the two components. And that goes hand in hand with the more extremes, rainfall intensity and so on. I agree. Uh, we, con we have to confess that the, uh, even though we went from 20 to 56, uh, we really didn't uh, pay so much attention to the sensitivity, to the high sensitivity. So that we, although we tried the 300 levels, but that, that's for stratosphere and up. So we didn't really uh, make the tropospheric resolution so high. So even though 56 levels, 26 levels might sound so much different, but it is, it's in the, within the same regime. Right. And one of the things that happened, I don't want to you know, dominate this, but one of the things that happened with the fine vertical and horizontal was the amplitude of the tropical waves, especially in the mid and upper troposphere, really strongly increased. It certainly would be relevant for hurricane generation, for example. And that was triggering a lot of this intense precip. But it looked to us like it was too intense, frankly. So 
So, so what what happened to the the mean climate? Mean climate errors. Uh, for instance, in particular, yeah. the tropical Pacific. You in our case, our conclusion is that the mean climate is uh, uh, so much sensitive to the physics package, but not to the resolution in as long as uh, our experience is concerned. So our uh, coarser resolution uh, error of SSD pattern and uh, final resolution is uh, strikingly the same. So it, it is the clouds, uh, clouds parameter resolution that dominates uh, the ov overall error pattern. So uh, so the only, only improvement you were getting with the high resolution were on the extremes? Extreme and uh, uh, crucial Gulf Stream separation and uh, all these things. In our case, uh, 20 by 30 kilometer ocean eddy per minute. <laughs> That might sound uh, too high uh, uh, in comparison with the atmosphere. Was one one <laughs> one of major reasons is that they try to get uh, ocean people involved in this business. <laughs> another, another one is that since we are living uh, close to the uh, crucial separation, we uh, had to have uh, crucial separation right, and we had in conjunction with the atmospheric uh, rain band. Uh, th that was the major reason why we adopted that one. So have, have you looked at the issue as to whether the climate sensitivity oh, yes. of the high resolution yes. model is the same as the coarser resolution? Uh, general tendency was the same uh, as it, with the uh, climate bias. Therefore, we used, we extensively used the uh, coarser resolution version of the model to try to investigate the sensitivity, which parameter, parameter is most important and so on. Then uh, we used that experience to uh, kind of uh, adjust uh, the higher resolution model. So as long as the experience, experience goes, that worked. And although there are minor differences, like uh, ocean optic uh, con uh, behavior is different between medium and uh, uh, medium. So the cloud feedback was similar in the two? The cloud feedback is similar, yes. So that, again, what you're saying is climate sensitivity depends more on the more, much more on, on the parameterization of the, the, the resolution. Yes. That's what you that's what you're saying. As long as bottom line, everything depends on the parameterization. <laughs> yeah, but that's right. the mean climate. Remember, they said they got better with the, the, the resolution. When you start want to look at variability, particularly small scale, you know, infrequent events, the resolution was important. Mm -hmm. Which is good because then it means it makes sense to do snapshots. And you're not going to change the right. mean. Yeah, the the behavior of precipitation right. uh, yeah. producing disturb weather disturbance and everything, uh, stratospheric sudden warming, all these things are much better in higher resolution. But it doesn't really matter for the average, time average uh, climate. It's the issue, it's the interesting things like Ansel. Ron mentioned the other day okay. that Ansel uh, is one of, the, <laughs> one of his critical factors. Uh, uh, I don't oscillations. want to talk about the Ansel because, <laughs> <laughs> because our Ansel is so shabby, very small amplitude, and okay. we couldn't uh, yet uh, even at high resolution. It, even in high resolution. So uh, again, the conclusion is that uh, for in order to reproduce Ansel, uh, the first priority should be going into the physics mm -hmm. uh, model. Okay. But so that's the resolution the of this at this stage doesn't really... Uh, Everybody should stop what they're doing and improve the polarization. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, that's, well, it, it, that's it, not it, a new thought. Earth system model having a physically <laughs> realistic answer for a point. Right. <laughs> that is a good well, well, we issue. Yeah, we've right. only been trying yeah. for 25 years. <laughs> well, I think you should get a lot of these things, you got to fix everything. Well, I mean, I, no, I mean, and so, you know, there are a number of models now that do get it reasonable looking at so but it is sensitive to the physics and to the resolution. I yeah. think both. Well uh, yeah we know GFDL that. has these two versions and this in one the amplitude's pretty good and the frequency's two years and in the other the frequency is a lot lot better and the amplitude's three times as high. And you ask them why that is. They, yeah, and then, <laughs> they and don't then want to talk models, about it. <laughs> some of the models that have a good MSO that have a good MSO don't have a good MJL. Oh well, I mean, yeah, and they, you, know, you got to get issues. you got to get that uh, right too. The, these, are light. <laughs> these are these are <laughs> coupled in a hundred ways. Claims they have an Enzo. Uh, we have an Enzo, which light. are tied in the monsoons. You know, which stuff both are convective. <laughs> There's stuff that looks sort of like an Enzo, but we're not going to claim it is. I mean, in our Enzo, it's definitely sensitive to the convection scheme. Uh, one version, we had a poor Enzo in it, and 
they changed one parameter in the convection scheme and it changed the way it was dancing, which is kind of nerve-wracking in a way, but, um, <laughs> but it is clear that um, that's one factor in, yeah. in, in those types of simulations. You don't get away from the convective scheme until you go to cloud resolving scales. Yeah. But then you don't. And then you got to deal with the microphysics, right. so that you know you don't win. <laughs> uh, let's let's look at the other side of the coin. This is what you're sort of being pressured to do. Mm -hmm. For this time frame, if you weren't being pressured to do it, what would be your druthers? What do you think should be done? Now this is in, now in an Earth system model context. I mean, what do you think? Uh, I mean, we've got I mean, my. Highest priorities were to improve the mean climate in ENSA, um, include uh, the carbon cycle, uh, better. Uh, Even say, for this time 20, frame, up to say 2030. Oh, no, 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 no. no. I'm, I'm talking about the, the longer term. Okay, but but if you're within this context that we're supposed to go to like 2030 or something, what do you think, if you weren't being pressured, what do you think should ideally be in that model? It should be done with it. Would you I mean, ideally, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be doing these short terms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, should I write that down? <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah, I mean, I've, <laughs> I've said that. I mean, um, in terms of the amount of time we have before AR five, anything else we have to do like this, to me, takes away people's time from improving the parameterizations. Um, yeah. uh, and maybe that so. should be in the conclusions. I mean. You know, if that's a consensus, I mean, that's that's a clear, you know, it's a clear trade-off. So I think that that's a legitimate thing to say that the group probably needs to say. Um, that, well, I don't know. I mean, that was my first, that was my personal <laughs> response because you you asked me what I was. We'll leave it anonymous. I, <laughs> well, I think that's that's a basic uh, uh, conservation of time conclusion. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm I must say, I mean, personally, I'm a little concerned about. Um, Doing these with a, you know, with a model that, but the physics aren't uh, really improved from what we've been last time, uh, and then these being interpreted as you know, yeah, forecasts yeah. for yeah. Yeah. regions in the U.S. I mean, I'm. That's, the people are doing it already anyway. They'll do it. They'll do it on the time scale they want the, the product delivered. Product being the forecast. Right. But it, not on the quality, on what you but, think is the minimum threshold for the quality of those but, forecasts. But if they're, they're already doing that now with these, you know, many regional downscale simulations that are crap. I mean, but, they're already using those. But if you're going to, yeah. if, if a product's going to produce that you don't have confidence in, you know, one way or the other, you know, if one, you know, holds back progress on what you think is really important and the other doesn't, well, that's... Because, but there'll always be somebody who says, the problem is, well, even though... A large fraction of the community may say we don't have confidence in doing this. There's always somebody who'll say they can, and the people who want the product will listen to the one who says they can. That's okay, now I'm about nature. a little, David. My uh, <laughs> <laughs> my thought would be right? that if we're going to do this, or, or the thing I want, I would want, right, in that we don't have now, right, is better aerosols <laughs> and an indirect effect, effect. <laughs> and something we may be able to do because young Franz, he's he's looking at me quizzically. Something about say air quality as well. Mm -hmm. So that we could say something about you know short-term forecasts mm -hmm. quote for air quality. So that's the sort of the one area that isn't in our particular model at this point that I think we probably should have in this. And, and that could be congruent with longer term as well. That's not a side branch. So that's the that's positive. Right. Now, I mean, the, the, in the sense that the, the downside of that is the when I listen to what the, our group want to do for aerosols. They're saying it's up to close to a factor of two in the atmosphere computation time. So, you know, so that's so that's you're gonna pay that in resolution or pay in aerosols. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I mean, if you really put that in, say you want to do the same number of years, yeah. then you actually back off on the resolution. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I'm I, I'm thinking of. See to my kindness here, but I mean, I'd probably say let's back off on the resolution and do the aerosols. That I think would be something different and new that we haven't actually done before. Yeah. Whereas you guys have actually, I think, have followed along with that. Yeah, I mean, the thing about the whole idea is that 
if you spend a lot of time on the aerosols during this time period, say the next 10 years, 15 years, we'll be getting a lot more observations of aerosols. We'll be getting observations of what actually is happening to the climate system. And if we can do the aerosols better and get an understanding of what the real forcing is, then maybe we can get a better estimate of what climate sensitivity really is. And that would produce better projections out to 2050 and even out to 2100, yeah. potentially. Clearly. Whereas, you know, I made some notes yesterday from the, the carbon cycle group sort of said on, on large space scales, you know, the feedbacks really weren't there for 20 to 30 years, that's what they said. Yeah. And here we are doing 25 year forecasts. So, I mean, yeah. I think that's a <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, I think that's not true on the uh, on the air. It's not true on the chemistry, yeah. 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 air quality, air yeah. Yeah. And that comes back to this this uh, the emissions the, the, the emissions sorry. inventories and scenarios. There there needs to be a different level okay. of attention for those to do that. Those if, are a couple. Of and if you really wanted to do aerosols really well, I don't know exactly what these people have in mind for that package. But you know, some aspects of atmospheric chemistry should be done too. Well, that, if so you're talking about air quality and ozone, that's yeah, no, that's, that's for well, sure. Well, that's for yeah. sure. But that, to do, even to do the aerosols, yeah. we're, we're not we're not quite sure if we can just use fixed oxidants, like maybe trending oxidants over over those thirty years, maybe monthly averages, which is what Phil has been using, except that he uses just fixed ones. So we don't know if we can just stick to that and forget the nitrates. Um, can do nitrates with fixed oxidants. At least I don't, I don't see as of now how to do it. So if you use, maybe it's not that important for the kind of aerosols we package we can put now in the following generation. Yeah, then we would, we would need. But for what Steve Gann has in mind, in mind, we may or may not need uh, the chemistry. Um, we're we're going to test that over the over the next year. It's supposed to be a version where they don't. They specify the oxidants in that's some right. way. Yeah. Mm, that's right. So we may do an offline. Well, we will do an offline simulation or, or one simulation, and then use those oxidants. Kind of version our group has as well. But presumably, if you have the capability of doing both, it will both ways. You can, and as you are doing, try to evaluate that question somewhere. Yes. To help mm -hmm. and give some guidance to the community as to mm -hmm. is, if there's an optimal strategy. For Okay. So these are nice, two nicely separated paths, actually. Both possible for this time plan, unlike the longer term. Or either are possible, and more realistically, in a sense. Yeah, exactly, one or the other. Or the other right? yeah. Why don't we take a break? When we come back, I think I'd like to try and say, if this type of experiment's going to go ahead, what's it imply for the scenarios we should... Uh, we should use, I think. I think when you say really this type, which of those two types do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about the uh, 205 to 2030 forecast. Yeah, but high resolution, high resolution or better or chem aerosols? Yeah, or both. Uh, I think it's got to be some combination of, uh, of right. both. I mean, well, <laughs> in the computer time, we'll one magically. set of emissions. Yeah, yes. Well, that's, that's there may be different requirements. That's for these a, two different. Types that's a question I'd like to talk about that's afterwards. Time. Should we do, for instance, one scenario and not and as many ensembles as we can of that scenario, or how relevant is it, say, for different forces in sulfur, sulfur, for instance? Mm -hmm. With that, if you, you know, really cut out the sulfur. Quickly, mm -hmm. would that make a difference by uh, 2030? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. So, and then difference to what? I mean, difference to climate or difference to air quality? And I mean, there's both. Obviously, one's obvious, yeah. and the other is not. Yeah. 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 And how would they interact? And and if just to get back to this thing you're being pressured to do. Clearly, one of the major things people will want to know regionally, if the purpose is to give people regional responses, is what happens to that hydrologic cycle region. Is it going to rain more in this region or not? And that's something that presumably will require a lot of ensembles. Any, any one particular run, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. you got, you got to reproduce 
the daily preset PDF. Uh, we have to. <laughs> <laughs> for many, for many of the community, and, and who's going to make you? <laughs> well, I'll put it this way: well, it would, we don't have to rephrase it. <laughs> it would be very nice. To I will. I will rephrase that. I would say a large part of the impacts community would like that and feel like that's what they really need as their highest priority. But that includes events with return times of fifty years. For example, I mean, because that yeah, really because they're going to be making that's an impossibility for right. simulations but, of twenty five. But well, it's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible to reproduce that. a daily PDF. That's how many so, ensembles I mean, you just, do. <laughs> well, okay. no, I, that's, that's the other way you would have to do it. Yeah. Right? What's the budget in terms of the number of runs you can actually make? That's my <laughs> that <was> solution. <laughs> yeah. Well, it I mean, depends well, if it's that, both. <laughs> well, but I mean, I just you know sort of. Well, no, but I mean, let's put a round number. Say it's ten. Uh, you Should know, that be return one scenario time event with may 10 now on the Sony five years return? Right. Right. I'm, I'm sure, sure that you can't one core scenario with a couple of right. sensitivity so runs off of it. Test the model yeah. over the longer Just one sensitivity off of it. it. So if you did, and and my feeling would be larger right. numbers of ensembles. Right. right. If you did that with a sensitivity, then um, you do just one run on that. We'll just ask the Frontier Center people to do it. Yeah. Um, so maybe time in the model. <laughs> half a dozen ensembles of a central one and a few single yeah. sensitivities off it. That, yeah. Yeah. That's that would be most, my sense. Yeah. But that's mm -hmm. the most that's likely why thing I asked the question. question. Yeah. Anyway, let's take a break and think about it some more. <laughs> But so think this day, but I don't think we have the people power or the time to actually uh, you know, develop fundamentally different uh, ones because the people, the people time is actually going in on these transactions. From what he says, if we get something that improves the, you know, the resolution we're more familiar with, it should, it should help uh, in the higher resolution. It's, Hopefully that's right with ours. Right. Um, yeah. I don't think there's One any guarantee, but it might happen. And then the question is also, will it happen the, the if presumably the, the real issue here is the, the U.S. regionally? Oh, yeah. yeah. Will it happen over the U.S. Yeah. as well? Yeah, I was, if it's the U.S. It was very depends impressed on that ridge and that trough. The amount of work you're doing over the U.S. The, is that really going to be the same I, with I different resolution back, models? You know, so I wish is the regional climate really going to be the same with the quality of I can see larger scale patterns and ITCZ patterns may be pretty similar. <laughs> Final resolution, your jet stream may well be quite different, storm tracks may well be different. The grossest mean errors globally stay there. I've not heard an answer to what you just raised as to whether uh, the simulation has changed very much over the U.S. Right. So that would be an interesting well, question. Well, you Usually can see the it, idea obviously. The precipitations over the Rocky Mountain, yes. and in that region at least, and probably, yeah. maybe a little bit useful. I mean, I mean how, how important is the yeah. Appalachian? It does have an impact. It does mm -hmm. have an impact. Uh, weather forecast models, clearly. Now, that's, of course, dynamics-driven rather than physics in some sense. But clearly, their different resolution models do get different results. Oh, right. They run well. And, and, you know, if you follow the forecast, you see the final resolution models aren't always better in terms of what happens. I think it's just a crapshoot, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are you, are you feeling these same sorts of no. pressures? Because no. Jim has carefully positioned himself that he answers to nobody. Mm -hmm. come right down to it. And so if he wants to do experiments...